Let's throw it back to the year 1310 of the Common Era to the French colonized West African gold rich country of Mali, which is bordered to the north by Algeria, to the east by Niger and Nigeria, to the south by Burkina Faso and Cote d'Ivoire or Ivory Coast, and to the west by Senegal and Mauritania. And many of us are familiar with Mali because of the Dogon people of its central plateau region and because of the ancient city of Timbuktu, which enjoyed a golden age as a major center for the trading of salt and gold and spices and dyes. And it was also a hub for Islamic scholars. And it was also the site of three mosques that loosely comprised a university system there that became a repository of great books and knowledge, Timbuktu. So we are in Mali. The year is 1310 and we will camp out, pitch a tent in the city of Nia. Niani, N-I-A-N-I, Niani, which at that time was the home of the brother whose story I am telling you today. He was a Mansa, M-A-N-S-A, a Mansa, which means emperor. And the village of Niani is where the emperor and his courtiers made their home. And it was also the seat of trade and commerce. So this was their Washington, D.C. And one of the reasons why Europeans and Asians and other Africans traveled far and wide to get to Mali at that time was because of the abundance of gold under her earth in that country. Like much of the motherland, Mali was gold rich. And the profusion of this natural resource, gold, made Mali one of the richest countries in Africa and made our Mansa our emperor, one of the wealthiest men in the world at that time. Those native to Mali are referred to as Malian, M-A-L-I-A-N. And we're talking about the Mandinka people, the Mandinka people. You may also hear them refer to as Mandingo, the Mandingo people of Mali. That's who we're talking about. So this brother, he was a Mandingo and the Mandinka are one of the four largest ethnic groups in Africa today. The other three being the Fula or the Fulani, the Hossa and the Songhai, the Songhai. So this story is about a Mansa, an emperor, one of two sons born to the sister of the founding emperor of Mali. So this brother had royal blood. And he succeeded his nephew to the throne in 1310. So after his nephew's reign, this brother became Mansa, became emperor over the 12 kings of Mali. And at that time, the country of Mali extended all the way to the sea. It is inland now, but at that time it extended all the way to the sea, to what we now call the Atlantic Ocean. So back in the day, Mali was a coastal country. Today it is not. And as a young boy, this brother began hearing stories about the extraordinary conquests of Alexander the Great and about the mysteries and the magnificence of the seemingly endless, unending ocean at his country's edge. He was fascinated by tales of a powerful current in that ocean that was said to catch up all who entered and toss them out at the uttermost edges of the unknown world. And his youthful mind began to race in wonder about what strange and exotic lands might exist and what unfamiliar people might live there at the other end of all that vast water. And as this brother grew into manhood, diplomats and scholars from throughout North Africa began arriving at Timbuktu for study, bringing with them even more stories that the sea was not some treacherous passage that delivered travelers into a black hole on the other side of the world, but that the ocean was a gateway to thriving cultures and landscapes far beyond what anyone had ever known or imagined. And taking these new ideas from the scholars, tapping into ancestral spirits, the medicine men and the feathered and masked court magicians threw down the bones. Y'all know how they do. They threw down the bones, foretelling of fresh futures. And from this tapestry, our young brother began fashioning a dream. So when this brother became emperor, he set his mind upon the one thing that had so captivated his childhood imagination. And his attention became fixed on a sole ambition to use all of his power and wealth and authority to realize his dream of conquering that ocean and seeing what was on the other side of all that water. The one thing that had always quickened his spirit that he had always been passionate about was making a transoceanic voyage. He longed 
to see what was on the other side of all that water at the edge of his country. And with all the instruments of power at his disposal, with the tremendous wealth of the Mali empire at his command, this brother began surrounding himself with people of like mind. He availed himself of the scholars and scribes, teachers and traders, diplomats and merchants. He took in the new ideas of the day and began to marshal the resources at his disposal to begin the process of manifesting in real time that which was already very much alive in his imagination. And the emperor became so consumed with this one pursuit that over time he paid less and less attention to the responsibilities of actually governing the country he commanded. And as a result, affairs of state began to suffer. Nevertheless, he persisted. This brother kept it moving. He was determined to build a fleet that would conquer the high seas and reach whatever and whomever might be at the center and at the other end end of the ocean. So the emperor sent out what we today would call an APB for all those who had knowledge of fishing the seas and lakes and rivers for anyone who was experienced in boat building and ship construction for men who had intellect and expertise in water currents and winds and direction finding by maps and stars, whatever you could bring to the table that was useful to the emperor's cause was welcomed and you were summoned to his court for that purpose. So as a result of this countrywide call to action, the emperor's court was abuzz with talk of the sovereign's grandiose plans and boatmen from throughout the kingdom submitted blueprints for the construction of ships with all sorts of shapes, sizes, and capabilities, arguing amongst themselves before the emperor for the superiority of this design over that one and putting his trust and faith in no one man's idea to fulfill his dream of crossing that ocean. The emperor commissioned ships of many designs, believing that a variety of watercraft, this is wisdom, that a variety of watercraft would ultimately prevail in nautical conditions that were foreign to all of them. Sail ships were built. Ships for oarsmen were built. Ships that could accommodate both wind and muscle power were built. Supply ships were built. Boats to store gold and other trading items were built. The emperor mandated that the fleet carry enough food provision for two years. Two years worth of provisions. So boats were built to house dried meat and grain and preserved fruit in huge ceramic jars. Great trees were felled in forests throughout the empire and floated down river to a massive seaside site of boat building operations. Blacksmiths and carpenters, magicians and diviners, intellectuals and merchants, potters and servants and artisans of all types gathered each day at that site to work, to help, to witness this grand project take shape. Now, at the time that this massive fleet was being constructed at that site by the ocean, the emperor also had several megalithic structures built and they were used to observe very long distances out into the ocean and to track the movements of the stars in order to test various astronomical calculations. And the ruins of those very great structures are still visible to this day in Mali. And as the fleet neared final completion, our emperor left his palace at Niani and encamped on the seacoast to watch the final stages of this vast labor force complete the work that was his dream. And when it was all said and done, all in all, 200 master boats and 200 supply boats were built and completed at that massive site by the ocean. And there came a day when the fleet, 400 boats strong, was ready to set sail upon the Atlantic Ocean. And the emperor issued this order. Do not return until you have reached the end of the ocean or when you have exhausted your food and water. Do not return until you have reached the end of the ocean or when you have exhausted your food and water. And the fleet left the shores that day and a great many days followed and no one came back and the emperor could find no peace.
And then one day, back in Niani, at the emperor's court, there was a ruckus in the crowd, a stirring of people, some unexplained commotion amongst the courtiers. People were murmuring and whispering, and word made it back to the emperor that a captain of one of the ships was waiting outside the gates to have an audience with our brother. And so the emperor commanded that the man be brought forward immediately. Get him in here now. And he was brought in immediately. And there came before him, slowly, a man in worn and weathered clothing, tattered really. And as he approached, the emperor suddenly rose from the throne and in one overexcited hop, descended the steps to meet the ship captain on the floor of the court. Sultan, we sailed for a long time until we came to what seemed to be a river with a strong current flowing in the open sea. And my ship was last and the others sailed on. But as they came to that place, they were pulled out to the sea and disappeared. This is the story the captain began telling the emperor. And the emperor said, so all is lost? And the captain said, I do not know, sire. I do not know what became of them. The waters there were strong and swift and I was afraid and I turned where I was and I did not enter that current. And the emperor stared ahead into space, transfixed. He said nothing. And the emperor turned away from the captain and step by step by step, he began ascending the staircase to his throne and he sat down and the emperor raised his arms and clapped his hands, dismissing the court. And it wasn't long after that the emperor left his palace again and with his court returned to the massive building site where the missing fleet had first been outfitted. He went back to the very shores from which the 400 boats had set out for the unknown world. And our brother was convinced that that world existed out there somewhere. The emperor went back to that same spot. He would not be defeated. And from that seaside encampment adjacent to the massive building site, our brother commissioned a second expedition, more extraordinary than the first, once again calling for all the country's expendable resources to be committed to building an even bigger fleet than before. And skeptics were everywhere. Naysayers lined the streets and fears were heightened that the emperor had gone completely mad, <laughs> that he would yet again sacrifice hundreds, thousands of his subjects to the devils of the dark sea. Nevertheless, the emperor persisted. The brother persisted. He never looked back. He never returned to his palace and to his court in the city of Niani. The emperor decreed that the second fleet would be especially outfitted for a specific boat, the flagship, that would have as its centerpiece a throne for the emperor himself. He would command the new expedition, just like Alexander the Great before him. He would lead the adventure to discover new worlds. He would be a full participant in his own dream. So in the year 1311, the emperor conferred the power of the regency on his brother with the understanding that if he did not return within a reasonable lapse of time, his brother would ascend to the throne and become emperor of Mali. And then one day, dressed in a flowing white robe and a jeweled royal turban, the emperor stepped onto the flagship, sat down on his throne, and set out with his fleet, heading west across the Atlantic Ocean. A wide and deep mass of ships led by a man, an emperor with a dream. And in my mind's eye, brothers and sisters, I can see our brother standing at the back of that boat, looking out across all that was his kingdom and at his countrymen, observing his shores and his subjects, taking in that single moment that he had dreamed about since he was a little boy, playing over and over again in his mind how others must have mocked and teased him, calling him crazy, trying to block his dream from becoming a reality. And in my imagination, I can see him standing there on the stern of that ship, personally outfitted for the emperor himself, as everything he had ever known, slowly, wave by wave, became smaller and smaller and smaller, till the waving hands became flickers and the gathered people pin drops in his past. And I imagine our brother walking to the ship's bow and up the steps to his throne, facing forward into the vast unknown, the feel of the headwinds on his eyelashes and ears and the surging sea slapping, slapping, slapping up against the sides of the ship 
And in my mind's eye, I see to the citizens of Mali, all the Malians, the emperor's subjects, gathered together on the shores, watching their sovereign set sail upon a dream, leaving them behind. I can see the wide-eyed young boys thinking, I want to be like that. And all the little girls with their astonished and skeptical parents watching and waving as their emperor glides away from his rule over them, becoming each moment a more distant mass on the skyline of the sea. I imagine them all watching and waving, watching and waving, watching and waving, until at last there was nothing left to see on the horizon except the faded glimpse of a man, their emperor, who would never return. This brother's name was Mansa Abu Bakari II. Abu Bakari, Abu Bakari II, ninth ruler of the Mali Empire in the 14th century. And brother Abu Bakari II, ninth ruler of the Mali Empire, never returned from that transoceanic voyage. And his dream was not deferred. Most of what we know about Brother Abu Bakari II comes to us from 14th century North African Arab historian Ibn Khaldun. Ibn Khaldun, K H A L D U N. And also from 14th century Moroccan traveler Ibn Butata, B U T T A T A. And also from 16th century Moroccan traveler Leo Africanus. The other major source of information about Brother Abu Bakari II comes to us from Mandinka oral tradition through storytellers known as griots. Some people call them griots. And many of the details I have shared with you this morning come from my brother, Ivan Van Sertima's book, They Came Before Columbus, The African Presence in Ancient America. They came before Columbus, the African presence in ancient America, which was first published in 1976 by Random House, Brother Ivan Van Sertima. They came before Columbus, the African presence in ancient America. Brother Ivan Van Sertima joined the ancestors on May 25th, 2009. And I must say, brothers and sisters, that there is a fierce debate as to whether or not Brother Abu Bakari II actually did reach Brazil. Some say he did. Some say he didn't. What's for sure is that he never went back to Mali. Brother Abu Bakari II, ninth emperor of Mali, was a great teacher of two things, risk and vision. Risk and vision. 